Well, thanks everybody for coming out this afternoon, sort of raining, looking like it's getting better. So, I'm Beth Bernhardt. I'm uh, the chair of the Faculty Senate Scholarly Communications um, Committee. And today we're having our Scholarly Communications Forum. And our speaker today is Christine Fruin, who is the Associate of, um, University Library at the um, University of Florida. Um, Christine earned her um, law degree from the School of Law at Southern Illinois University, a master's degree in library science from the Graduate School of Library Science at the University of Illinois, and her bachelor's um, degree in poli sci from Knox College. Please um, join me in welcoming Christine today. Thanks. Well, thank you all for coming. I was going to say brave the rain, but I, when I turned around and looked outside, I'm like, wow, I actually see sunshine. So it's been really a, 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 a great day to be here. This is my first visit to, to Greensboro and to your campus, and I'm very appreciative to Beth and the libraries for, for bringing me up. Um, they have an opportunity. I've had a great session this afternoon with graduate students talking about copyright um, and how copyright impacts the authoring of their dissertations and, and their own rights as authors of those works. And, and, and this afternoon, what we're going to talk about is is really getting more into because I see some of the, the graduate students have come to this talk, so I must have I must have done okay. If they want, they want more. So we're really going to be delving in today about um, rights of authors and, and, and responsibilities as as well. Um, what authors responsibilities are in terms of um, disseminating their research and making it accessible by the broadest audience possible, which is nowadays accomplished through what we know as open access. Um, so right now, I'm, I'm going to challenge you to, to think about um, an article. I'm, I'm going to assume that all of you here, but by show of hands, how many of you have authored an article that has been published in a commercially published journal? Just about everyone. Um, most of you first named author that had actual responsibility for signing the copyright transfer agreement with the publisher as well. Okay. Now think about why did you publish that article? Um, what was motivating you at the time to publish that article or even to publish it in the journal that you selected to publish it in? Um, and we're going to talk about how whatever those motivations were um, is really going to be impacted by your management of your own intellectual property in that article. Um, does anyone want to, just by way of example, what I mean, you can shout out, raise your hand. But why did you, what was your motivation for publishing that article that you're thinking about? To make lots of money. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Journal paid you money? To I'm assuming you're joking. <laughs> Usually not a lucrative, lucrative uh, endeavor to publish a scholarly article. Anyone else? Tenure. Tenure, yeah. That's, that's another big one. To get the work into the public domain to be used. Pu okay, you said public domain. Mm -hmm. Well, I was in publishing and it was a, a measurement tool. Uh -huh. I wanted it to be used in replace of ones that were currently being okay. used. So be okay. Okay. All right. So, did you publish it in an open access journal or in a way that could be found by a lot of people? Or was it in a uh, paywall? Just a subscription based journal. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk. I, I actually have, I have a list of my own. Um, so, you know, there's, there's reasons for publishing. And then also think about how you want to use that article after it's published. Um, so, and I apologize, this is so small. Uh, if you can't see, see it, I, I didn't go to the front. Huh? So yeah, you you can move up, of course. Um, don't be shy. Um, but I, I made my slides available to Beth, and, and I mean, I'm happy to have these shared, you know, out, elsewhere if um, you are for back to later. But um, so reasons for publishing, you know, to make an impact, um, of course, you know, you want to be viewed as a, an, an important contributor to your field of research. To build a reputation, which is really important for early career researchers and, and even graduate students, um, to establish yourself as an expert in your field, um, to engage with other scholars, um, it's, it's a great way to connect with colleagues at other institutions, um, perhaps um, foster you know new projects or even lead to grant funded work. Um, someone mentioned tenure; that's a big one. It's a very big motivating factor. Is there are departmental or institutional expectations about publishing in a particular journal. Um, a term that frequently gets turned around, you know, thrown around is, is impact factor. I have to publish in a journal with a certain impact factor. Um, I really always push back and challenge um, 
faculty and, and department chairs in particular about being so married to this impact factor. Um, most people don't realize that the term impact factor is actually a proprietary term. It's a commercial product owned by the company Thomson Reuters. And the only journals that have an impact factor are journals that are indexed in their commercial product known as Web of Science. Um, that leaves out a whole host of very high quality journals that maybe don't have an impact factor simply because they haven't been selected by Thomson Reuters to be included in Web of Science. So it's very unfortunate that we are so tied to something that is so monetarily driven and really not really not geared towards measuring what truly is the best best research out there. Um, professional advancement, um, I, again, that might, you know, if you're, you might, maybe you'll be like me, you'll get invited to go to um, other universities to speak because you're recognized as, as an author um, in a particular field. And I did write down to make money, so um, maybe, even so, even monograph publishing isn't necessarily that profitable, I think, of an endeavor. Maybe the royalty checks are, you know, small um, if you publish a monograph. More importantly, how you want to reuse your stuff after you publish it. Um, you might want to reuse it um, perhaps in your teaching, um, have students read um, your articles or your books. Um, you might want to share it um, if you are working on a project with colleagues at other institutions. might want to um, set up a site where um, you, know, you post your work as a, as a means of contributing to maybe some new um, part of scholarship. Maybe you're wanting, you know, maybe you've written several articles and now you're wanting to write a book. And you know, based on how you managed your copyright to those articles is going to greatly impact your ability to incorporate those articles into a, maybe a book. Um, I just finished working with a professor up uh, at UF um, who we had a lot of stumbling blocks. She had quite a few articles that she was wanting to incorporate um, big chunks of in a, in a book that she wrote for Cornell University Press. And we had to jump through a lot of hoops to get permissions to use her very own articles because she had signed all her copyright away. Yes. So I, I don't know if you want to go back to this right now, but, but your, your comment about impact factor, I, I think it's well taken. We don't want to get too carried away with it, but yeah. we do live in an age of predatory and junk journals. And I think we want to be cautious about making sure that, you know, I, I look at this as, as a dean and a, a senior faculty member, making sure that my colleagues are publishing in reputable outlets. Sure. So and, and an impact factor is not is really truly not a good measure of of what journals aren't junk. Um, there's plenty of subscription based what we what a lot of faculty would call reputable journals that are even published by big name publishers that if you really took the time to look carefully at the content is 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 junk. Sure. So I mean can you offer an alternative though? I mean what what would what guide and maybe this is something you're gonna get to later, but what <coughs> guidance would you provide, especially for younger faculty, in terms of how can they be sure that they are pursuing reputable outlets? I mean sure. my, my graduate students for instance are constantly getting solicited from oh. junk journals and you know my mm -hmm. the, yes. and I'm having to cautious do not go there. Absolutely. And, 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 I, and, I, and I, I am going to talk a little bit about how to evaluate journals a, a little okay. bit later on. Um, don't spend, a, I'm not going to, don't intend to, and we can certainly talk about it. Um, don't intend to spend a whole lot of time on that, but you know, we can. And there's actually a, a relatively new um, tool that has come out that is the product of several different publisher organizations and scholarly publishing organizations called um, Think, Check, Submit that gives a really nice checklist that anyone can employ, whether they're looking at a subscription-based journal, an open access journal, um, of some quality um, markers to look for when, eva when evaluating a journal. And definitely, I'm, I'm glad that you are you know, encouraging graduate students to trash any email solicitations that they get because, and, and I tell my graduate students and faculty this all the time, no journal of quality is going to solicit you to submit content. It's just that that's it's a big so red flag. To them. So I, I know because it's, it's a real boost to their ego because they'll you know they get this email that oh you you know we found your dissertation on X Y Z and we invite you to write an article and, and then they do it to faculty and faculty are just as gullible as graduate students and um, and so, so but that, that that right there though is, is <laughs> no one in this room. But if you ever have a question, who should you ask? Librarian. Librarian. <laughs> <laughs> we can do the research for you and make sure that it's a quality journal. So, but if, 
aside from that, I mean, in terms of servicing your, you know, your motivations, particularly um, in how you want to reuse your works and, um, and, and reuse your own content, <coughs> copyright and, and managing your copyright um, is really, really, is very important. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bore you for a little bit with some, some copyright basics. Um, and really, as the author of these articles, you are, you are the copyright holder until such time as you give, as you give those rights away. Um, and as that, as that author, you have this, what they call bundle of rights, rights that are exclusively yours, um, such as the right you know, to copy your work, the right to sell it, um, the right to um, make translations of it, you know, which is what we would call a derivative work. Um, if it's a um, musical or um, you know, a movie script or a play script, you have the right to perform or display. All these rights are yours and yours alone, but you can al always give permission to others to, to do that. Um, Oftentimes with publishers, they require you to transfer all of these rights, even though they clearly don't need all of these. Um, transfer all of these rights to them. Most copyright agreements with publishers request you to, do, to give all of this away, leaving you absolutely nothing. So when you are then faced with, well, I wrote this book, I want to use you know, six chapters of it in my class, or I you know, wrote this article, I want, to, I want to share it with others by posting it on my website that I've set up for my lab or for my research, you're suddenly in a position of you can't do that um, because you've given all that right away. Um, and you've also put your university in the position, the university that pays your salary and, the, and pays for your graduate students that perhaps helped you do the research, to have to turn around and buy access to that work. Um, and this was work that you probably didn't get paid to do, to perform, your students didn't get paid to, um, to, have to assist you with, um, but universities are in turn, and, or you, if it happens to be an article maybe that you don't, that the uh, library or the university doesn't subscribe to and you want to reuse, you know, you might get that lovely little button, oh, to buy this article, pay $49. You know, but wait, that's my work, that's my article. Um, so, like I said, it, these, these bundle of rights can be, can be parsed out in, in pieces. Um, they don't have to all be given away. Um, they can, you know, licenses can be, can be granted um, to um, avail, you know, others can, to avail themselves of these rights. And it really comes down to, you know, how that um, copyright agreement reads. So there's different modes and models um, today in publishing. Um, Scholarly communication as we know it in publishing really started with scholarly societies hundreds and hundreds of years ago. You had these small guilds and societies um, that were in the, what, you know, the purpose of which was to produce and disseminate research. And then we had the, the rise of the commercial publisher who then came in and, and kind of bought um, you know, all this literature and, and publishing from these scholar societies and these kind of mega publishers um, grew, such as your Elsevier's and your Wiley's and your Springer's. And then in the last you know, 12, 15 years, we've had this rise of open access publishing, which is really about um, not charging subscriptions, not, not kind of throwing up that paywall to access, and really encouraging access and discoverability um, by a much larger, broader audience, basically. If, if, you know, if someone can, can find it online, they, they can read it. Um, and then we also have, so we have open access publishers, and then we also have repositories where folks can put their stuff regardless of where it's been published and again in, in an openly um, uh, discoverable and readable way. Different models of publishing, different business models. Traditionally what we know is things are subscription based to what we call toll access and that's you know your traditional journals where you're paying an annual or actually not you perhaps but the university is paying um, or if you you know go out in the workforce your, your, your business or whatever have, have it is paying um, to access and what has also been commonplace is with that subscription-based um, business model also comes with the full transfer of copyright. Um, in the open access model, different kinds of business models, um, usually when people think of open access, they automatically think what's well, going to cost me as an author. Um, and statistically, that's actually not the prevailing model. But, but most people believe if I publish in an open access journal, it's going to cost me. They charge author's fees. I mean, I think it's because, unfortunately, the, the, the ones that we automatically think of when we think of an open access journal, so your, um, your PLOS ones, um, your Biomed Central journals, do charge authors um, fees. But statistically, and there's actually the most recent statistics have been, most journals do not charge author fees. It's, it's wholly produced um, and made available without collecting fees from, from, from authors. Um, 
different models that have been experimented with include, um, there's a journal known as eLife, or um, no, not Eli, eLife, yeah, eLife, mm -hmm. is funded by researchers. Um, there's three researchers, um, including the Max, uh, Max Planck Society, um, Howard Hughes Medical Center, and I always forget the third one, who are funding it themselves. Um, there is also um, Peer J, um, which um, is a, a multi-science journal, and they are experimenting with a membership model, or for $99 um, provided, you know, you can publish so many articles per year, provided that you, you know, still pass through the rigors of a, a double-blind peer review. Um, so different business models are being experimented with. Not only business models, but also peer review models are being experimented with, um, more so in open access than in scholarly um, publishing journals. So this little flow chart kind of demonstrates how copyright is controlled in publishing. So as I said, copyright belongs to you, the author, um, until you give it away. And this typically happens at the moment that and I, the, the, uh, I do hear about there are some journals that, and I, and I hate this, um, require you to sign a copyright transfer agreement at the time you submit the paper. And I always tell authors, don't do that. Uh, if you can avoid it. Unfortunately, with these automatic online submission systems, it's a little hard to avoid. But really, it sh it, until that paper has been accepted for publication, should, there should not be any kind of transfer agreement signed. But there are publishers that do this, um, have you sign it at the moment that you submit. So at, at, up until that time, the, the ball is really in your court. Um, most people feel that they have no choice. Um, I, I have to sign away my copyright or they won't pub they, the paper will not publish it. Um, I, and and my, my challenge is push back. Um, negotiate with publishers. Um, there are um, resources out there that you can use. Um, there is a, we'll talk about it a little bit later, this author's addendum, which gives you nice boilerplate language that you can counter with to substitute into your copyright transfer agreement, which gives publishers what they need, enables them to do their business, make their money, but at the same time retains for you the right to reuse your work and make it more, more accessible to more folks and allows you to reuse it and allows you to retain your copyright, which is a, actually is a, very valuable, is a very valuable thing that we shouldn't be giving away so freely. Um, so copyright management then you know, becomes very important. And as I said, subscription-based journals you know, typically are gonna require a full transfer and they do that through a copyright transfer agreement. Um, open access journals um, frequently use what's known as Creative Commons licensing, which allows more author control of copyright. You control, um, you know, how your work can be how your work can be reused. It can only be reused for non-commercial purposes or educational purposes. Um, and, and there's different levels of licensing within Creative Commons, um, and that gives and that allows you to retain more of your control while still at the same time maximizing. Um, Accessibility, and then which therefore leads to citability, which you know is just another way of measuring, of measuring impact. If more people can read it, more people are going to cite to it. So let's. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, publisher agreements and kind of what some of those look like and things to look for. Uh, and again, I apologize. I know this is probably hard to kind of hard to see, but this is um, Wiley Blackwell um, and their current copyright transfer agreement. This is very common language that we see. And so in exchange for your article being published, you, um, all this lovely legalese, that you will transfer um, during the full term of copyright, so your life plus 70 years, all of your rights including but not limited to the right to publish, republish, transmit, sell, distribute, and otherwise use the contribution in whole or in part in electronic and print editions of the journal and in derivative works throughout the world, in all languages, in all media, now known or later developed, and to li license to permit others to do so. You're giving all of that to this journal um, by signing this. A lot of people sign it. How many of you have signed one like this? How many of you actually read your agreements before you sign them? <laughs> um, later on in that same article, yes, sir. Can we go back to that last Absolutely. Can ask some questions sure. about that? So the first sentence, which isn't in red, you're assigned the copyright. Yes. Yeah. Are you assigned the copyright to the whole work as a collective work, or are you assigning the copyright to all parts of that work? The red part gives them the right to license all parts of the work. 
Are you talking about an, you're talking about an individual article? I'm talking about so you've got an individual article that's got let's got say it's got photographs in it. Let's say those photographs have got letters and numbers on them, and let's right. say that the photographs right. are arranged into place. Just to it's, make it it's, nice and complex. If if you have and that this is a very good question. If you have incorporated the copyrighted works of others in your article, you really don't have the right to assign copyright to that. It's it's looking at this whole article. So that's what I call the collective work. Yes. But yes. so it's not so that. So if there are first, if there is a photograph in that article, and the and you've gotten permission, either you as the author have gotten permission or have asserted fair use, and in including that photograph in your article, someone else can use that photograph, of course. So, but it's but really it's anything that you've written in that article you you've signed, assigned copyright away for. I mean, well, let's it, just say I took the photograph. Just okay. To make it simpler. Typically, yes, it's going to include the photograph. Yes. So any figures you've drawn, photographs you've taken and included in it, it's going to be the whole thing. Because it's not clear to me that that says that. Oh, believe me, that's how they, that's how they would interpret it and well, treat it. Now, yeah, now we're getting into the real problems here about who gets to interpret these things. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> during the full term of the copyright and any extensions and renewals, all copyright to the contribution, the contribution is capitalized. Contribution meaning the article. The there, article, there's an which is a collective work containing yep. text, figures, and the figures may have been modified from the way they were originally taken. So they were, and whether they were transformative works, the figures were transformed enough to be considered transformative work. I'm not sure. It's, you understand what I'm trying to get at? I want to know if I, those figures, that fic photograph that I took. Yes. I take a fic photograph of you, I put it in my pocket. I put mm -hmm. labels on the thing, I label yeah. the eyeglasses, I label the dress and all this yeah. stuff. Yeah. I put it in a plate with figures of every, everyone else in this room, right? So, and I think, uh, let me just take a position on this so we have something to argue against. I think what I gave them the right to is that plate that thing that I created, which has all those labels on it, yes. which is a collection of those things, I did not give them the right to that original photograph of you. Is that correct or is that not correct? I would say that's arguably correct, but I'm but I'm also going to say that I could I could see some publishers pushing back and saying it it's, it's the photograph also. Is that gray area? It it is. It's, what, what you say about it's, it's gray. gray. You know how we, when we, you know, we talk to several people about anything related to the stuff that can be gray. It depends on the publisher. And I've, I've actually helped someone in anthropology recently who wrote. Um, it was for it was for a um, it was for a, for a book. He was doing a chapter in a book, and it was in anthropology. And so, along with the text, he had numerous numerous photographs. And he brought me the copyright transfer agreement. He had this very same concern. I said, Christine, I do not want to give away. You know, if they, they want the text and stuff, that's fine. But I, I want to be able to reuse these photographs in other, whether it is, um, you know, a display in a gallery, perhaps, like a, 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 at, our, at, our, at the museum on campus. And so we had, we had some back and forth and back and forth, but we had to rewrite his copyright transfer agreement to make it clear that only a license to use those photographs was being given, that copyright to those photographs was not being transferred to the publisher. For just that reason, because we didn't want them to come back and say that copyright and photographs was also transferred by the virtue of this agreement. And the publisher allowed you to do that. They, so. they do. You, you, sometimes it takes a lot of back and forth, but there are. But publishers are willing. But you know they're willing, like, oh, you're going to sign this as it? because enough people do it, sign it as is. The, of course, I mean, it's, you know, just like there's people out there that charge for public domain works. Um, Public domain, because uh, you, I, I have to address this because this is one of my <laughs> pet peeves, is people not know, you know, public domain refers to works that copyright protection has expired. So your, your use of the term public domain was, I mean, I'm not, I'm not singling you out or picking on you, but well, it was not correct. There, there, there are issues that have come up later, which is one reason why I, I specifically mentioned that one. Yeah. I know I'm not answering your question is because there's there is not a black or white answer. It it really depends on the publisher you're working with. And what I'm saying is there are some that would argue. Um, and so what's their what's their recourse then if they say, let's say I read this and I say that doesn't give you the right to the original public original photographs and they, they say it does, the recourse is that they're gonna sue me or they're gonna sue. Oh gonna so sue uh, how would you what? I guess it really depend would depend on how 
you reuse that photograph? Because my, my guess is, is that your later subsequent use of that photograph would probably qualify as a fair use. My guess is if you put it like on a conference presentation, you know, a conference poster, or even included that single photograph in another article or in a book. Because that photograph would be a very small piece of this whole article and probably is not the, you know, the seminal part of that article. And so you probably would have a fair use argument. But if I wanted to publish it again, then it would be up to the second publisher to read the copyright agreement with the first publisher. And, and, and again, I would push back with that second publisher, then I would push back and I'd probably make a very, you know, it's fair use. I don't have to get permission. Because that's what happens. Then you put yourself in a situation, do I have to come back to publisher A and get permission to use this in, with publisher B? It's very complicated, which is why, is why I'm trying to caution you against signing these things without thinking about how you might want to use this work later. And have the conversation and a dialogue with publishers and not just sign these things um, and, and push back and, and spell out that, that exact kind of situation to make sure everybody understands before anything is signed. And if they refuse, you know, and then it becomes a situation if they refuse to publish your article unless you sign this as is and you have that reservation, then you publish it elsewhere would be my response. But I know faculty, especially young faculty, frequently feel that they are not in a situation because there are P and T expectations to publish in this particular journal. They don't feel like they have the ground to stand on to make that decision. Which is why we have to change P and T. <laughs> and stop and stop putting so much weight in publishing in this particular journal and be open to you know different methods of evaluating impact and and you know how we are being you know amenable to different forms of scholarship and, and and measuring you know what is what is valuable but that's a soapbox for another day but that's very, a very good question i know like i said i know i'm not satisfactorily answering your question because there really isn't a satisfactory answer So later in that same agreement, um, after you've signed everything away to Wiley, they are very gracious and come back. And then, because they are now the copyright holder, so now the roles have been reversed. Before you were the copyright holder and you could have you know, just ins insisted that they get a license, now they are the copyright holder and they are very gracious to give you a license to do a few things. To make copies of the article and share it with your colleagues. Um, to reuse in other publications. So here would be reusing that photograph in another publication. So they, they do address that in this, um, in, this art, in this, to use it in teaching, and if you're gonna like do a conference presentation um, on it, they give you the permission to talk about it. So now let's look at the other side, um, and, it's, and we're gonna look at some agreements that maybe aren't quite so you know, all-inclusive or have some different kinds of um, provisions in them where the authors are given a little bit more control over um, over their rights in these transfer agreements. Um, you see this both in subscription models and in open access models. So I want to talk a little bit about open access. Um, a lot of misunderstandings about what it is and what it means and, and what it you know how you go about making your work available open access. We had a really great conversation this morning. Um, I would almost like to see us move away because open access has gotten such a negative connotation that it's more about public access and making your work available to the public as opposed to, because you know, like I said, open has just gotten really kind of twisted around. But the, the phrase open access was coined by Peter Suber, who is the director of the Office of Scholarly Communications at Harvard. Um, and he coined this term back in 2001 when a very small group of librarians, publishers, funders, got together in Budapest to talk about the, the problems with the current scholarly communication system. The economics were, were really broken. That you had you know, these large communities of scholars producing research for free and turning around and giving full control and ownership of it to publishers who were then turning around and charging them thousands and thousands and millions. And I mean, it's, it's a billion dollar industry, scholarly publishing. You all aren't making that money. Um, so open access, very simple in its definition. What it means is it's scholarly literature that is digital, online, um, free of charge, um, and free of most copyright and licensing restrictions. Open access does not mean copyright. There's still a copyright holder um, with open access. It's not giving your work away. It's not giving people license to steal it or claim that it is their own. It's really about giving 
not only use the author's control back over how your work is used, who gets to access it, um, but also about increasing readability, findability, citability. It, it really is a win for, for authors um, because it allows them to control who sees their work instead of allowing publishers to control it. There are two ways to accomplish open access, and again, this is where there is frequently misunderstanding. When people hear the term open access, they automatically think it means I have to publish in an open access journal. That is one way of achieving open access, publishing with a publisher or in a journal that distinguishes itself, calls itself open access. Um, that is also what we call gold OA. Um, a different way of achieving open access, and in a way that is, you know, my preference, um, is, is about archiving. Putting your work and retaining the right to do so in a publicly accessible repository. The one that we have here um, is, is NC Docs. How many of you are familiar with, with NC Docs? Okay. So NC Docs is an open, um, open access repository. Just about every, it, it's the cool thing to do now, just about every university has one, has some version or type of institutional repository. There's also a lot of subject-based repositories out there. Some have quite a long history. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of Archive, A-R-X-I-V. Um, it's the large physics um, and computer science um, open access repository. Um, and it's been around for, I don't know, like 25 years. It's, it's been around a long time. Um, and it's where anyone from any institution can deposit their scholarship as long as it's in you know, their subject matter expertise. Um, and it's accessible by anyone. Um, to achieve Green OA, though, it, it really does require you to, um, you know, it doesn't matter where you publish, but it requires authors to be mindful of what those copyright transfer agreements say. Have you retained the right to make your article or your book or what, whatever it is that you're wanting um, to make accessible, have you retained the right to do that in that copyright transfer agreement? Um, and like I said, that's, that, that's, that would be my, that's my preference. I don't want to tell you where to publish. Publish wherever you want. If you want to publish in that high impact factor journal, because that's what your department expects, by all means do that. I'm not here to tell you not to. Um, I think it's a broken system and we need to get away from it, but I'm not going to tell you you shouldn't do it. What I do want to tell you is, this is a valuable thing that you are producing, this research. You have spent countless hours. Um, I'm sure you're passionate about it. I'm sure you care about it. Don't just give it away. It's, it's a valuable piece of property. That's why we call it intellectual property. You wouldn't just give your house away that you had just spent months and months and thousands of dollars remodeling. You wouldn't just say, here, here's the keys, all yours. Change the locks. Don't do that to your research either. Don't just give it away for someone else to make money off of. Um, and then rent, and then charge you a lot of rent to access it. Oh, this is really tiny text. Um, so some say, well, what are the benefits for publishing? And I say publishing in open access, or like I said, going the green route and making your work available, retaining the right in your tr um, transfer agreement to make your work available. Lots of benefits. First of all, your work then becomes available to the widest possible audience. So whether it's your colleagues at um, UNC down the road, um, it might be colleagues in developing countries that you want to do groundbreaking research with. Um, it, it makes it the most you know, available to the widest audience. If someone's got a computer that they can sit down and run a search and find it, um, or they know where you've put it, um, or you can give them a link that they can access and then they're not going to have a screen that pops up and says, you don't have access to this. You need to either buy a subscription or pay $50. Um, again, Authors retain the copyright. I'm sure you're going to probably be really sick of hearing that by the end of this. Um, but that's also a big benefit, is you are retaining some right um, to do that. Um, just because the work is available, whether it's through an open access um, journal or through a repository, I mean, you're still, you still are entitled to credit. It's not giving up the right to be credited for it. Um, people still have to cite to you. Um, you can't be, you know, doesn't, it's not a license to plagiarize. Um, and again, there have been numerous studies showing that um, work that's made available open access has higher citation rights than um, articles that are locked behind a paywall that are only accessible to those that can pay a subscription. Um, and it's just kind of, it's, it's natural to think that. If people can find it and read it, they're more likely to cite to it. Um, and you know, we talked about, you know, again, how different ways of measuring it. There's lots, there are lots of different um, metrics that are out there. There's this growing field called altmetrics, um, which is um, a really exciting 
um, field of you know alternative ways of measuring impact. Um, looking not just at articles, but looking at author, looking at citation rights, even in things, you know, things like tweets. You know, are people tweeting about your research? Um, you know, it, and news stories and things are going to be much more likely to even pick up on it. So, um, lots of different ways of measuring that. How do you find um, open access venues, whether it's journals or repositories? Um, you may or may not be familiar with the directory of open access journals, um, the web websites up there. That is a database to be listed in this database. Um, cri quality criteria have been made much, much stricter than it was when DOAJ was started. Um, it's a pretty involved application process. I think it's now, oh gosh, like 45 or 48, maybe even more than that, questions that publishers have to answer before their journals can be included. And they have to provide documentation as to um, you know, whether or not they allow authors to retain copyright. Do they utilize Creative Commons licensing? Do they have an archiving system in place? Do they have a plagiarism um, checking system in place? What kind of peer review do they have? Um, you know, is, it, is it single blind, double blind? What, what are their policies? Is there editorial board um, list? <coughs> are institutional affiliations for editorial board members listed? There's a lot of quality markers that have to be checked before a journal can be included in the directory of open access journal. Um, I mentioned earlier, thinkchecksubmit.org um, was a tool, very easy to use. I encourage faculty to consult that when they are thinking about publishing in a journal that maybe they are not sure of. Some really simple things that you can do to check, some quality markers to look for. Um, as far as repositories, kind of going that green OA route, um, you already know about NC Docs, which is your institutional repository here. So anyone affiliated with um, UNCG, and I, I learned today that I did not know that several other um, North Carolina State Universities also, um, institutions also um, submit to that. Um, or maybe you want to look into a subject specific repository um, and submit your work there. You can submit it both places. You know, the more places you get, the more likely it's going to be found. Um, but there is also a directory of open access repositories, opendoor, D-O-A-R, dot org, where you can search not only for institutional repositories, but also, but, um, also subject based. So if you know you are authoring a paper in political science or in economics or in um, sociology, you can find a repository that collects that kind of stuff and you can submit your work to that as well. Yes, ma'am. So regarding PubMed. Yes, PubMed Central, uh-huh. Right. So this is a new thought. So I thought PubMed indexed and, and you know, put the articles up there from the journals that it threw from. So the authors can actually, if, they, if, the, if you for some reason publish an article that wasn't necessarily automatically going to be abstracted, I thought PubMed, you could submit your article. In PubMed Central? To PubMed? I think PubMed Central. Um, I think they're mostly NIH funded articles. I don't think anybody can submit to that. Because a lot of the journals we publish in, like in public health, are yeah. automatically pulled into PubMed. And pulled into PubMed. Right, like the journal of public health, or a lot of the biomedical central uh, art journals. So both the regular journals and the open access are pulled into are pulled into that, that system, yeah. But I just was I didn't know if anybody could just like submit their article. I'm not, I'm not sure, which is probably, I probably maybe need to not have that one up here if that's not, if that's not true. I don't really know. I was just curious. I tried to help a faculty member with this a while ago. They had the same question. Um, and, and just to be clear, the PubMed is, is the database, the index that identifies all kinds of articles, medical and health related articles, not just articles from public access or open access journals and PubMed Central is that open access repository and I, I think it um, PubMed Central has mainly been a repository for the, the grant funded uh, projects from the National Institutes of Health but some publishers do submit some of their materials to PubMed Central I believe. Okay. PubMed Central is a repository for journals that are deposited by participating publishers as well as for author manuscripts that have been submitted in compliance with the public access policy mandated okay. by NIH. Okay, so it's NIH funded and, and publishers who participate. So any individual author 
cannot <coughs> submit. So I learned something today. Yay. Yes, they are. Um, but other, you know, archive, bio, there's a, not a bio chi, bi, I never have, it's really weird, it's B-I-O-X, or B-I, I can't remember. Bio archive, but it's like B-I-O-R, big capital R-I-V. Um, there, there are ones out there that, en that are open to anyone from any institution. The other thing I again want to stress is, you know, because you mentioned, um, you know, she mentioned, you know, it's, it's, it's open access journals, it's subscription based journals. Again, when you're depositing with a repository, it's about retaining the right to do that, regardless of where you published. And, and it may or may not be the published version, and, and this, we're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little about this, it's very important to make sure that you are clear when you sign that copyright agreement if there is any kind of limitation on what version of the article you can post. Um, different publishers have different policies. Some, some publishers will allow you to put in a repository an open access repository, the PDF version, the published version of your article, so the PDF you download right from the journal, um, after maybe a certain number of months have passed, it might be six months, it might be 12 months. Um, some will only allow you to put the, um, kind of the post peer review manuscript, so it's not the all, you know, paginated, stylized version, um, it's, it's just kind of that, that, that pre-publication manuscript. Some will say you can only post the actual submitted manuscript that hasn't been subject to editing. Different publishers, but you know, my, my point is the content. Um, you can get the content out there and then provide a link if someone really wants that pretty paginated version, they can, can go get it if, if they want to pay the money to get it if they're somewhere that doesn't have a subscription to it. At least the content itself you know, is, is gonna be findable if you at least have the body of that manuscript deposited somewhere that is um, searchable and crawled by, you know, search engines. Search engines can't crawl with um, Science Direct or whatever it's called these days. What's, what's Elsevier's? It's still Science it's Direct. It's still Science Direct, okay. You know, Google can't, I mean, they can't pull back all that stuff. But they, they are gonna pull back the full text out of a repository. So two different ways to locate um, open access, public access <coughs> stuff. Um, and open access, public access is really becoming the norm. And so um, there are, um, you know, we mentioned at NIH. Since 2008, anyone receiving funding from the National Institutes of Health has to make their work available um, in, in PubMed Central within 12 months of publication. Um, in 2013, the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House um, mandated that all other federal agencies who have extramural research budgets in excess of $100 million have to adopt similar policies. Now, they were supposed to do it by August, they were supposed to have draft policies ready to go by August of 2013. That date came and went. Um, it really wasn't until this year that um, all these other affected agencies have been um, posting their. Um, posting their policies. Um, some of them actually went into effect, including the Department of Energy, went into effect October 1st. Most of the other agency policies are going into effect January 1st. Um, so if you, in the room, um, are you know, someone who regularly gets federal grant funds, you need to be real aware um, that, this, that this is now a requirement. Most of these plans, um, now I wouldn't even say most, some of these plans tell you where what the repository is, where you're supposed to put your article. A lot of them haven't worked out that infrastructure yet, which is why it's important then to come back to a place like NC Docs and at least be in compliance. Okay, I've made it available. You haven't told me where to put it yet, but I'm going to comply like, at least by making it available through a public access repository. Most of these plans also speak to data. Um, data, data, I, I interchange the two. Um, the, that being available publicly as well. There's been a lot of pushback about that, and I and I and I and I get it. I get why researchers don't want to make that available too soon. Um, and again, the infrastructure for that has not been completely worked out. I don't think they're really sure yet. Do we really want to be making all this stuff available and where? Um, but definitely, the scholarly articles um, need to be aware of that. Um, teeny tiny little link here. Um, Lots of librarians and folks have been working together to crowdsource um, a spreadsheet that is tracking all of these policies as, as they are being released. 
and it's done on, you know, several columns as far as what the effective date is, if, if there is a repository, what is it? Um, some of the agencies are going to be used, utilizing PubMed Central. Um, Department of Energy set up their own, it's called Pages. Um, agriculture has Pub Ag. Um, <coughs> some just aren't sure yet. Um, they, they, they figure they have, since there's a 12 month, they feel, feel they have a 12 month window from publication to kind of NIH. There's this embargo, so they feel like they have some time to actually come up with where stuff has to be um, posted. In addition to the White House directive, there's also pending before Congress. Um, it's come around several times. I'm doubtful if it's ever actually going to um, be signed into law, but this iteration of it is known as FASTER, um, Fair Access to Science and Technology Research Act, um, which is looking to make all federally funded research publicly accessible within six months. Um, that was sitting in committee as of August. Um, don't know if it's going to, don't know what's going to go with that. And even some states are getting in on this. Um, California actually has enacted on the books um, a, a law that all um, research um, produced by state employees has to be made available in a publicly accessible repository. Um, New York and Illinois have laws that have been enacted by the legislature just waiting for the governors there to sign it um, and for all their state employees to have their work accessible as well. So not funded, not research that was funded by California mm -hmm. taxpayers, but research produced by... By their state employees, exactly. Because, you know, they, they, because they're, 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 it's state money paying these employees as part of their jobs to produce research, which, and that, their salaries, is, is public money. And so that's kind of the rationale behind it. Yes? Do they exist universities in this? Nope. States? No, they do not. Nope. Which is, you know, and because, because Illinois is just waiting to get signed, I think that was um, University of Illinois last week signed um, a open access policy for their university. And I think it's just because they know that this Illinois law is, is going to be, is, is just a matter of the, and the problem is, is that the legislature passed it right when Illinois was in the process of electing a new governor. So, um, don't know, you know, don't know what's going to happen with that yet. But other, other funders as well, um, in addition to federal, so the Gates Foundation, the American Heart Association, funders as well are coming out with these mandates. If you get grant money from us, you got to make your work available in some publicly accessible format. You, some um, Gates Foundation actually requires you to use a Creative Commons license if you get money from them. Um, so, like I said, the, the, the tide is to, is to make research um, available to everyone. Um, institutions are getting in on this um, as well. Um, several institutions, Harvard, the University of California system, MIT, um, Duke, Georgia Tech, um, numerous colleges and universities are adopting mandates um, requiring their faculty um, to make their work available through the institution's repository. Um, those policies um, can take a couple different flavors. Um, different institutions are are adopting different types of policies. Um, some are merely, um, Florida State University as an example, are merely doing an endorsement. Yes, we as an institution agree that public access, open access is a good idea. We encourage our faculty to um, make their work available through our IR to retain their rights, um, but there's not an actual mandate or requirement. It's just more of an endorsement. Yes, we think this is, this is a good thing. We want to encourage folks to do it. Um, much more popular is um, what we call a deposit policy. This is also known as the Harvard um, style policy because Harvard was really the first big university to do this. And under this Harvard style policy, um, they are using the Copyright Act to their advantage. And in that are you know, treating the authors as having, you know, holding copyright until such time as they sign it all away. So in that little window of time, um, granting the university, by virtue of a policy, permission. That's all it is, just granting the university permission to make, a, to make their faculty members' um, articles available through that institution's IR. Um, some of the concerns that faculty have raised with these institutions in response to these policies is, you know, well, what if I have a publisher that doesn't want to let me to do that? Well, that's why these policies have a waiver. Automatic. You have a publisher that's not going to want you to let you do that. No problem. Policy doesn't apply to that article. Simple as that. 
Um, some policies also allow for embargoes. Well, the publisher I'm working with doesn't care if they don't want it out there for six months, 12 months. No problem. We have a mechanism to do that within the work repository to make something dark, to embargo it for whatever period of time, for the period of time that you need. It's still going to be out there. So um, that's kind of the deposit. Um, what some universities have done, and I, I don't like this type, and it, it really is discouraged, is called kind of a retention, where it's kind of putting the onus on the author to actually engage in that negotiation with the publisher to retain rights, whereas the first kind of policy, this deposit policy, the, the, the permission is already there. It's, it's a pre-existing license to the university before that article was ever submitted. And so any agreement that you sign with the publisher is subject to that license. But like I said, publishers may say, eh, we don't, we're not going to publish unless you, you know, make that license go away. And most policies say, no problem, we can waive the license as to that article. That's not a problem. Because again, it's not about preventing anyone from publishing where they want to publish. We all realize that there are certain expectations that, that, that need to be met. And so, you know, it's, it's not about getting in the way of that. I thought I saw... Did somebody have that? No, I saw, I thought I saw someone with a question. Um, so those are the different kinds of institutional um, policies that are being passed. So now let's go back to um, agreements again. So this one is from a Taylor and Francis copyright agreement. And again, um, reads very much like the Wiley one um, in that it is giving, you know, a full assignment of rights to the publisher, you know, to publish, reproduce, distribute, display, store in all forms, formats, media now known or later developed in all languages and da, 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 da. And then in that same agreement, so now with NIH and even with these institutional policies, publishers have started to include clauses where you have to disclose whether or not, um, and right now you see a lot of, and this one is for NIH, where you have to disclose I'm an NIH employee, or I am the recipient of NIH funds. So notifying publishers, I am subject to this requirement. Um, so some publication agreements, full, full so right, right there in the language of the agreement, not only a full transfer, but acknowledging <laughs> that there is this pre-existing requirement that you have to that you have to meet as an author. Um, PNAS. Um, Again, this, this is a little bit better agreement. This one is just, and again, I apologize, I know it's small. Um, the circled text is this are not a full transfer of copyright. In this PNAS agreement, it's merely a transfer uh, uh, or a grant of a license. And this is an example, this is really all publishers need to do their business, is to be, to be given a license to be the first publisher of record um, and to, you know, to be entitled to citation as the publisher of record and then to migrate that work into other formats. So if they move all their content into another database, or maybe they're a print journal, I know there are those are still around that are print only and they decide to go online and they want to be able to make your work available digitally. This kind of license um, would capture all that. And then it clearly states down here, ownership of the copyright remains with the author. Um, so, um, you know, this, this is kind of what we kind of want to see. Um, and it includes the right to post the work um, in um, repositories um, and so on. But they do impose the requirement that it not be done until six months. Um, so they impose all these kind of conditions. They let you keep, so it's a, it's a really good compromise. Um, there's a little bit of an embargo, but you remain the copyright holder. You're just giving the publisher permission. Um, so here's an example, though, also of this, um, like I said, they impose the six-month embargo. And here is an opportunity to disclose that, oh, yes, I work at an institution, maybe I work at Harvard or MIT um, or University of California that has an institutional open access policy. And they know that these policies have waivers. So here they're requiring you to get that waiver. Um, so you didn't have to, you know, it kind of makes it easy for you. You don't have, you know, just check the box. Okay, I'll get the waiver. Um, here's another example. This is from Springer, um, and again, just it's just an assignment of a license to Springer to publish the work. 
um, and then permission to the author to make the work available in a repository, an institutional repository, I think even on a departmental, I can't remember this the one, a departmental website. Um, but again, a 12-month embargo. Yes, you can do this, but please wait 12 months. And you can make the published version. Um, or no, this one's the accepted manuscript available. So different kinds of clauses. And then this is um, a library science journal, Journal of Librarianship and Scholarly Communication, which is an open access journal. And this one, again, only gives a, a grant of first publication rights. Um, and they utilize a Creative Commons license. So this is just an example of a publisher um, using Creative Commons. So to kind of summarize, so what do publishers need? To, in order to charge subscriptions, make money, all they need is a non-exclusive right to be the publisher of record, to be the first publisher. Um, to be entitled to attribution and citation as that publisher of record, and the right to migrate work in future formats. And that's, that's what I challenge authors to come back to publishers and say, let's amend this agreement so that, so that you get this. And so I, and then I can retain. And if they want to impose an embargo, and I don't like them, but if that's what you have to compromise on, okay, I want to retain the right to make, I want to retain my copyright and make this available, but I won't do so for six months. Um, negotiate with them, talk with them. Um, don't just accept. Um, so read those agreements carefully. Um, you know, make note of any rights that you retain or maybe there's rights that aren't sp are, um, spoken to that you want to retain and be prepared to, to work with publishers to do that. Um, edit the agreement, um, don't sign it, you know, talk about it, um, propose different language. Um, SPARC, which is a, um, an organization um, that we librarians love, um, has an author addendum which gives you some boilerplate language that you can use. Publishers are very used to, we encourage folks to use the Spark addendum because it's something that publishers are very accustomed to seeing. You're not going to be throwing something at them that they or their, or their lawyers have not seen before. Um, so I know sometimes that makes them kind of nervous and can sometimes um, make things take a little bit more time if they have to run it by council, but this is something that most of their councils have seen before. Do your research on your journals before you even submit to them. Um, a really great site is Sherpa Romeo. Um, and it is a site that um, tells you what a journal's copyright and archiving policies are. So you can go to the Sherpa Romeo site. Um, you know, say there's a journal that you are wanting to publish in. Um, type the name of that journal in there. I mean, I can, do you want me to go and demo that site? Yeah, okay. Good. Type in the journal name and it will bring back a record for that journal and it will list, tell you first of all, um, do you as author retain any rights in that agreement? Is it the right to archive? Um, archive what? Is it the, um, the submitted manuscript? Is it the pre-publication version? Is it the publication version? Is there any embargo imposed? Um, there's also usually links to if, uh, a copy of the copyright agreement so you can look at it ahead of time and maybe be prepared in advance of even submitting you know, how you might want to edit that agreement, um, whether or not it is an open access journal um, or if they offer open access as an option. A lot of subscriptions, this is, again is something I, I don't encourage but I know faculty will do it. Um, there's a lot of subscription journals out there that have an open access option where yes, your journal, uh, your university is paying $30,000 a year to subscribe to this journal, but if you want to make your individual article available, you can do so for the nice hefty price of $3,000. Um, that's journals double dipping. I don't encourage it, I don't like it, but I know that there's you know, well-meaning faculty who must have deeper pockets than I do that are, you know, want to make their work available open access and you know, are willing to pay that fee. Um, I don't know, your open access publishing fund, do you support those hybrid fees or not? Usually not. Usually not, okay. I know some do. We did, but only at, at, a, at a lesser rate when we had one. But I don't know what your policy was on that. And then, if you do have the right to archive it, do it. <laughs> um, you have that right, use it. Um, if you don't know how to submit something, um, ask the library um, how to get your stuff into NC Docs. I know they're there to help you. Um, or if you're not sure if you have, if you've retained the right, again, um, they can help you look at those agreements and determine whether or not. If it's something you've already published five years ago, and you're like, gosh, I would like to make all this stuff available that I've written two, three, four, five years ago. That Sherpa Romeo site, again, if you didn't keep a copy of your, I mean, how many of you kept copies of all the copyright agreements you've ever signed? 
Um, look up journals you've published with previously in Sherpa Romeo, and you can see what you know what their policies are, and know what can I publish or what can I um, archive there. So, okay, there's a lot of talking. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Um, thanks. I learned a lot here. Um, I certainly agree that journals is a scam, especially the commercial journals. I think they really take from all of us and they reduce university budgets. I don't need to, to agree with you on that. I'm sure there's consensus on that. <laughs> but thinking about, and I don't disagree with any of the advice you gave us here. In fact, I learned some things that I didn't realize I had as an author. But I guess my question is, I think de facto, there is an open access policy. That is, when I publish something, I mail it to anyone in the world who asks me for it. I post things on my website. I don't expect a publisher, well, yes, someone could come after me, I'll remove it. Yeah, that's not well, the and, and, that's, and, and that's really, I, I mean, so if it's a but, university website, you might have a general counsel's office that's unhappy with you for doing that. Fine. But, um, I will speak with the counsel <laughs> and I will, I will remove the article. Uh, I published the book where I used two scholarly articles in it. One of them was a lot of revisions. The other one was not a revisions. So There's a footnote saying that this draws upon this work. It's mine. Nobody really bothered this. So I guess the question I have for you is, how extensively, how, how many authors complain that they end up being charged for something? Because it seems to me that would be a case if you produce something that generates a lot of revenue. Then people are very interested in copyright. But the vast majority of scholarship publishing, what people are interested in is citation. So yeah. it seems to me that all the journals I've published in, they're thrilled that people get access to the work because the journal gets cited, and that means then people demand that the library pay those high fees to get those journals. Yeah. That depends on fuel. So I'm not sure how how real the problem this is for a lot of us in the scholarly community. And I mean that as an open-ended question. It's yeah. not a rhetorical rejection of what you're saying. Yeah, about. yeah. I mean, but I, and I want to say that in, in faculty I've talked to, I think you are kind of a rarity. Because I've talked to far more faculty who do run up against not being, you know, you know, you know, or maybe a little bit more um, honorable of the law and don't wish they could post the stuff they've written, but don't because, I mean, that is copyright infringement. If you've signed away all of the cop copyright to those PDFs you're posting to your website and to those articles, you're, you're committing copyright infringement. But that's, that's... I can invite you to many websites. <laughs> oh, I know it's do done. I know it's done all the time. Um, and I know, and again, mailing out PDFs to, to colleagues at other institutions, I mean, you know, I would say probably often, many times that's fair use. I mean, you're not running a foul of the wall. But I, I, but I've talked with enough faculty where they feel that um, their citation rates are impeded by publishing in, in paywall journals. That they feel like they could get if it was more accessible and more findable by more people that they would get cited more. That they do feel impeded, especially in using their works in teaching. Um, that they are feel restricted in that. Um, you know, it's I. I would say you're rare. I'm not so sure. Okay, <laughs> that's all right. But thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had gotten an email request from the I think it's the American Psychological Association that they want they have a um, a book of some sort that they put together that compiles measurement instruments, and they sent me an email wanting to put a scale that I had developed into that, but I had to sign a document to say that I had the copyright to that, mm -hmm. and from this particular publication, and or they wouldn't put it into their book. And the journal that in question had is <coughs> right? It had gone belly up. And oh, this okay. Happened really, a long time ago, and I couldn't get any any satisfaction anywhere because the uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't publish that unless I actually signed saying I held the copyright. I don't hold the copyright. And I couldn't figure out how to actually get, you know, get satisfaction. And then I talked to the, I think the lawyer here, and really couldn't advise me because then I wouldn't sign that. Yeah, if you're not sure that you're a copyright holder, you shouldn't right. be signing so saying something saying you are. It was bought by some German company somewhere that had a, just a German uh, website. So it just got to the point where I just like threw my hands up. Yeah. And I wasn't really quite sure. Um, I couldn't move forward. Yeah, it yeah. All. and although it had been published in other compendiums, um, so um, 
But the other thought that I had was the research gate and all of those sorts of places now that are taking our research and compiling them and they're in a in on online some way. Mm -hmm. And that's my understanding that it that I don't know if this is true that in order for them to do it, they assume that we hold the copyright. They're not oh, copyright from else. The, uh, the, the ResearchGate has already been subject to numerous takedown requests from companies such as Elsevier for uh, for doing just that. I, I don't know if they are making assumptions or they just don't care. That's uh, uh, they just don't care mm -hmm. that they'll just put the stuff up. And I, I don't think ResearchGate's doing it on their own. I think individual authors have to put it up there. It's both. They ask it's both. This okay. Like they ask. Okay. Okay. And so then they they. I mean, I think research case might be only one, but that's the one. That yeah, the one. you know, academia, um, academia is another one that that does that. So, um, I don't. It's it's it, it, you know, and it, it's a difficult position for me because on the one hand, you know, I recognize that there's the law, and I want to encourage people to, you know, follow the law. But on the other hand, I say push the envelope every opportunity you get. And I love there there's a there's a movement there. Um, you know, that people on Twitter, you know, will put out on Twitter, oh, I need such and such an article. And it's this, you know, I can has, I, it's a hashtag, I can has PDF or something, which is, it's just, it's, it's, it's spitting in the face of publishers, and I love it. It's a way of people say, oh, yeah, you know, they put out there on Twitter, I need this article, and someone will send it, you know, somebody will send it to them. And then you thank, you know, you put out on Twitter, oh, thank you, you know, acknowledge you sent it to you, but it's, it's, it's a way of, you know, I'm doing just that, that, this kind of scholarship. Now, whether or not that really is a runs a file of copyright law, you know, sometimes it might be fair use. Sometimes if you've downloaded it from a database that your university subscribes to, that license agreement might have a scholarly sharing provision, which already gives you permission to do that. Um, so, you know, I don't really have a problem with that. I, I, I get more concerned about people putting stuff on web, public websites when they, when they don't own the copyright or the rights to do it. I, I do have a problem with that. Um, yes, the worst thing that's going to happen is, is you're going to get a takedown. But I feel like we are not really making a strong case with the publishers about you know that this greater overall scheme, the the economics of scholarly publishing <coughs> needs to be changed. Um, you know that they shouldn't be they shouldn't be making all this money off of faculty members' backs. I just don't think that they should be. Um, we shouldn't be like I said. It's it's a very it's a valuable thing that that faculty should not just so willingly give away. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I just wanted to make a mention about NC Docs. Um, something you said isn't quite accurate. Okay. You had mentioned that a faculty member would have to uh, go back, look at their um, article, look at the copy publisher, and see if. Uh, they retain the rights to put it in a repository. And actually, with NC Docs, if you were to send your CV to like Beth or someone, um, I would actually check the copyright of that article okay. for you to see. Well, someone is still it. checking it though. Yeah. If, 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 if in this case, if the, work, if the workflow is that the faculty doesn't have to do it, you know, yeah. I, I don't know what your workflow is, <laughs> but somebody is still checking. It's just. That's just my okay. entire job. <laughs> <laughs> and we appreciate it. <laughs> yes. So, I think so I'm in psychology, I think in the social sciences and sort of life and physical sciences, there's a lot of interest in, in sort of the goal of open access. Um, but the money is, is really is a barrier. Because like in, in this kind of work, like instead of like a book every three years, you might have some sides of the life of physical sciences, you could have 5, 10, 15 publications in a year that are all really short. And for, for the places with the stronger reputations, like Public Library Science Frontiers or, or Nature Scientific Reports, $800 to $1,500 a piece regardless of length. And I think the, if you know, like we have a lot of National Institutes of Health funding, and they're, they're not going to let you write in eight to 10000 a year for, for publication costs. So I think yeah. this is... I think this is something that kind of is, is actually like the pinch point for, for those really taking off is the amount of money they want is really substantial. I, 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 I don't disagree. It's to find a whole line of work yeah. on it. Like I think it's... And, it's and this is something that, thing. you know, universities and libraries and faculty need to be having conversations about is, you know, 
do we need, you know, libraries' budgets are already being okay. cut bare okay. bones. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I know, I know that there are a lot of libraries that have had conversations about whether it would make an impact to start cutting subscriptions and diverting that funds to supporting open access um, publishing. I mean, I, I don't know how that's going to be successful. I don't think that's going to make a dent in the problem at all. Um, I think that we need to try to get away from this, you know, if, look, encourage publishers to be looking at alternative funding models and get away from this um, author pays. And like, but though I said, statistically, a lot of journals don't. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. some of the, the higher um, profile ones do charge article pricing charge. I recognize that uh, you know grants are not are not allowing um, mm -hmm. those kinds of fees to be written in written into grant proposals. Um, so again, it comes down to, I, I mean, I applaud the interest in publishing in an open access journal. Um, start your own. Start your own. He did. Um, what, what's that? They were working on it, right? No. Um, you know, there's people that if, if you know are, are utilizing you know infrastructures that are. Do, do you guys use OJS? Yes. yes. Um, so host your own. Your the, the infrastructure is already in place. Um, start one. Start a journal in your field that doesn't charge fees. I mean, the, the system is already there and being paid for. It's it's part of administrative costs. So that's one way to look at it. Or you know, like I said, um, publish in you know journals that you know that you can retain the right and make your work available through a repository. That's the that's the best, most mm -hmm. immediate, immediate way to address it. Again, probably not a satisfactory response, but I mean, I, under, I understand that problem. it is a complicated yeah. problem. Yeah, I think like the, the commercial publishers just have this massive first mover advantage where, like, um, we just got a paper, it's a very strong journal, 12 month embargo, impact factor is like 23, like if you're, if you're a grad student or a postdoc, you will always, always want to send your work there, no matter how good you open it. So they kind of have, they have the field in the mind. Yep. And they know that, which is why they keep charging. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to take a collective response uh, of taking, and like I said, taking away the importance of that, that we publish in this, I mean, we need to, and it's not, you know, I'd like to say one school could do it, but it needs to be, it needs to be collectively. Um, that universities need to just be, and I know that this state and Florida are not the only universities hurting financially, um, and there, you know, is, is and a lot, you know, there's a lot of money that goes towards supporting um, these publishers that that you all are producing on the university and the state's dime. Um, so enough universities need to get pissed off and and come back to publishers or and 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 say, you know, we're not going to do this anymore. We're done. But. Um, there is a group, um, the same folks that started Open Journal Systems, the Public Knowledge Project. Um, they are looking at um, John Walensky. Um, it's oacooperative.org, and they are starting a new project to look at exactly that problem. Problem is how do we how do we get away from, you know, encourage open access publishing, get away from this article or this author pays model. Um, I feel very optimistic about what he can accomplish. He's a pretty dynamic, um, make things happen kind of guy. So, but like I said, start your own journal. <laughs> no, uh -uh. <laughs> why? And why? Uh uh. Oh my word! You can't you can't write a lot of articles and edit a lot of articles. I, I worked in small press publishing before I was an academic, and I I know like the it's it's not a casual thing. I'll throw it back to you. Why don't the libraries fund the people to do these journals? Because that's essentially what you're asking us to do here. Right? Well, so they, they do it through, I mean, they, they do it through hosting the platforms. But I mean, do you mean providing the editorial services? Every, or Everything. I mean, I think <laughs> the existing model is, has problems, but it's nice that somebody does this professionally and it automatically gets circulated quickly. So you're going to convince us to migrate if you come up with an alternative like that. Now, I certainly think that we're forced into this not very nice alliance with commercial publishers <laughs> and the publishing industry. Yeah. I, don't, I hold my nose every time I do one of these things. When the natural alliance here should be between us and you. But I'm, I'm looking at Beth to see what her response is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I do think some, some universities, um, you know, library publishing is, is, is really becoming a thing and some universities are are doing this, some libraries are doing this, that they are funding library publishing units and have looked at, you know, 
what what can what money can they throw at um, you know having a staff person to help with editing and layout and and facilitate um, you know peer review and can it be done with graduate you know can it be done with graduate students at least to you know handle the submission piece and um, I mean it's, it, I know that there are libraries with I know there are libraries out there um, Purdue is one and, and some other that are that are doing that um, that their libraries there have been able to designate funds to, to support that. And a lot of times it's, it's with universities that have a, you know, or they're doing it in cooperation if there's a university press. Um, we are starting to do that just in talks with, in Florida, it's kind of messed up. We have the University Press of Florida, which is the university press for all of the state universities of Florida. They're housed at UF, but they, but they are the university press. Well, now it's changing. Now it's going to become the University of Florida Press. And we have been, we have started to um, work with them to do just that, to do faculty, you know, what can the press provide in terms of support, whether it's staff persons, what can the libraries provide in terms of, um, you know, technical support to do just that, to support and help faculty publish journals through the imprint of the University of Press of Florida with con in conjunction with the library. So, I mean, there are, there are places that are, are led, so I think that's a, a good suggestion. Yes. I mean, I think you know fully well why the answer would be no to start one's own journal. I mean, first of all, faculty's time is so tight right now, it's hard enough to carve out time to do our own research is number one. Second of all, we don't have the expertise. Third of all, it would la lack the cachet of meaningful presses that are out there. I, I really don't, I mean, it's, it's a nice answer to offer, it is, but I just... But let me, let me, I mean, you know, you three across, is it... Is it worth it? Is it easy though for you to say, oh, it's easy to have these publishers do it for us when you're not the ones writing the check to them? Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't. You kind of don't realize the, you know, the. I mean, for instance, at UF, we pay we pay pay us for five and a half million dollars a year. Five and a half million dollars a year for them to edit things. But unfortunately, if you go to a thing like the Washington mm -hmm. and say, I want to do the right thing, you, it's just not a credible argument. Again, the, the real line should be between us. It should not be with the commercial publishers. Okay. So if you're going to break this alliance, because I think you But you mentioned P&T. Changes need to happen there as well. Because uh, if, yes. if you don't lessen that requirement. But remember, no PT committee is going to listen to this argument unless you come up with a substitute for scholarly access. <coughs> if you can come up, you know, the best journals in my field are not published by, I think most of them by commercial publishers, but in the fields that the good ones are, you have to go to the faculty members and say, here are substitute journals which will be given just as much credibility, and it has to be a, precisely that, a credible argument. That's the nut you have to crack. Everything else, is just not going to be, it's, no one's going to really pay attention. And I think that, again, this is the alliance should be between us because maybe we can save money and in the end increase our salaries or have more money for research <laughs> or do something. And so I quite agree with that. Good stuff. I, I'd say y'all need to start having some meetings and some, some conversations. <laughs> well, we're in just such a, you know, a, a time frame, right? Like there's a lot of dislocations because the system is shifting. And so we're moving from one way of having done stuff forever into this whole new area. And so there's a lot of dislocations in terms of funding and P&T. And, and I've been on the Starly Communications Committee for a number of years. And so every time we we have the same, some of these same conversations when we talk about open access, when we talk about community engaged scholarship, or when we talk about tech transfer and how how faculty's work counts and gets recognized within all of these different domains. And there's, so we have, a, it's, a, it's a very similar conversation that um, we, we're concerned about moving into community engaged scholarship and spending the time we need to do that kind of work because P&T isn't going to count that. Or we're afraid about tech transfer because p and is not going to count that. Yeah. And the same with this open access. If it's not in the scholarly association's journal, then PNT is not going to count that. And so I think that we actually have an onus to start to have just some of these conversations because we've had some of these conversations around community engaged scholarship. 
and we've got sets of criteria and standards and, and education and training around how to better count that in our PT documents. And so some of it is us, you know, our unwillingness to change and get out of our own patterns and ways of doing things. So that I just I've seen that same conversation for two or three years in all of these different areas. And so I think that we can we can start to change our own culture. You know, it may not change Sure. And, and that's really it. It is. It's a cultural change, and that is a hard. It's a hard thing to change. Um, well, we've done it in some areas, and I think that we can, you yeah. know, start to have the type of conversations we need to have now. How we're going to support faculty moving into different types of publishing venues or arrangements or whatever. I don't think the problem is P and T at all. I don't think it really has anything to do with P and T because. Motion tenure decisions are made at the department, and the department can make those decisions where they, in any way they want. They could say, you know, I mean, you can't have a university conversation about PT. It comes down to the people sitting around the table in the department, and they're going to make the decisions however they're going to make those decisions. You can't influence them except by quality. I think the problem really comes with here I am as a young faculty member or a faculty member, and I need, a, I need to see a publication that's published in a paid access journal. And I have to have I have to cite that publication because it bears on the research that I'm doing. I have to have access to that. And if you prevent me from having access to that publication, my career is harmed. Not because of P and T, I mean eventually it comes down to P and T or things. But there is no way that you can fix that problem with P and T. You can't say, oh Beth, that's okay. You couldn't cite the most important article in your field and we will give you promotion and we'll promote you because you couldn't cite that because we don't have an access to that at the library. Yeah, that's you that's not about P and T. You're never, no one's ever going to agree to that. Under and you, I mean, you're dreaming if you think that's going to ever happen. They have to have access to those things. And so maybe there's no solution to this except get more budgets for the library. <laughs> you mean, I'm all for that. I mean, the person who has to cite, if you've got an article written by a Nobel laureate, and you have to cite that because it bears on your research, you have to cite that article. You have to have access to that article. There isn't a choice. Doesn't matter where it's published. You have to have access to that article. Um, but I mean, I, the, not, library, I, the library, the library, well, the library cuts subscriptions cut and, and use. And, okay, so you're talking about no. diverting funds to to different publishing. Or does anything else? I mean, it's, it's really the article. Is, I think the discussion about whether it's about P and T is a red herring. Well, it's a, no. It's, it's not. It's not about access to research to cite your own. It's about requiring. Um, as kind of a threshold or a benchmark to achieve tenure that you ha that you yourself have published in, in, in a particular journal, and, and kind of you know keyholing or pigeonholing that you know faculty can only look at this narrow you know this narrow band of journals they they're only kind of given a choice and so they therefore aren't exploring other other avenues to make the research available because there's this expectation. To it to achieve to be successful that they publish you know here, and and not able to look at some other venues that could be just as valuable but because they don't have particular you know an impact factor or they haven't been around for 50 years that we aren't giving it equal credit. That is it's not counted. That's that's what we're talking about. Well, I have to think 